Hello and welcome to Lane Time Chat episode 34. It's good to have you, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, we are excited about today, um, well, this particular episode anyway, because we decided that we wanted to talk about Kejwa. And so Kejwa is a language David and I created, but like we created it for people and it got roughly 0.2 seconds of airtime in static. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to give it some more attention because literally if you sneezed while watching the show, you missed what we did. Or if you were just hard of hearing. I, that too, that too. Um, and so Kejwa is a language that we created for a show called Paper Girls. And so we're going to go through what this whole thing was, what our process was, and why we like the language so much. Because seriously, both David and I were quite excited about this language. Yeah. And so Paper Girls was originally a comic book series. And it was created by Brian K. Vaughn and Cliff Chiang, and it was published in 30 issues. So like, seriously, they're actually, they're really good. I have read them. And so go check them out. They're amazing. We chatted with Brian K. Vaughn too. Uh, Cliff, we did. Cliff Chiang was the illustrator. Brian K. Vaughn was a writer. Right, right. Yeah. And as far as I know, Brian like came up with the entire storyline, right? Like mm -hmm. Cliff was just illustrator side. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but like the illustrations were really cool um, mm -hmm. because they were really um, late 80s, early 90s inspired. And so um, a lot of fluorescent colors and designs uh, from the era, it was really, really well done. Um, and the comic books I thought were really interesting. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, the comic books focus on four newspaper delivering teenage girls. Yeah, and this, that's why it's paper girls and not paper girls. And it's like, I think that when I first read it, I thought it was paper girls. And I was like, huh, what is a paper girl? And then it's like, <laughs> once I realized, you know, what they did, it's like, oh, it's paper girls. And it's like, isn't that a, a weird little quirk of English not reflected in really our orthography? Is. But also, apparently, you never had paper dolls, and so you weren't like, oh, sure, That's it's a I, paper girl. Yeah, and so, so like, I was like, it's, a, it's like paper dolls or something, and it's like, why girls, you know? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but no, they are newspaper deliverers, um, and they are young teens. And um, you're probably wondering, why in the world did we create a language for for teenage girls delivering newspapers and I think it was in Ohio. Mm. It was somewhere like really normal. I think it was Ohio. We should uh, back up slightly for those who haven't seen the series and who are younger than we are. Um, young people used to deliver papers <laughs> for money. Newspapers. Right. Um, and this was like a regular, uh, like not only a regular, but like a standard kind of like a, a job that you just knew about. It's like once you hit around like fourth grade basically once you could be trusted to ride your bicycle to school on your own that was when you started you know it, it, it was a time where people would deliver newspapers and what would happen is that you would literally wake up at three or four in the morning and go to a distribution spot where there would be just a big truck and all of the uh, paper boys or paper girls would come on their bicycles that have like a little basket or something on the front and they'd be like all right you know what's your name here are the papers that you're supposed to deliver and you had a list of houses that you would go by and literally just throw the paper physically onto the property um, and this is a very normal thing so much that i'm sure neither of us really reflected about it but I think if you were born, say, after 2000, it might sound a little preposterous. And it would sound even more preposterous when although, you hear what they were paid. Although I will say the only reason I knew about this job was through media. Because, of course, where oh, I lived. because you lived in a rural area. Yeah, and there were no... There, like, our paper was delivered by a car that had to drive down the highway because yeah. they threw out. And, like, they threw... If you, You've been to where I grew up. 
And so they would throw, we only got the Sunday paper, that's the only paper we ever got, and they threw it down there right by the highway. So we had to walk half a mile to get it. Sure. And so like that to me is paper delivery. So I only knew about this, you know, fictitious job through like, you know, books I read and, and things I'd seen on TV. But at this point in my life, I was like, oh yeah, they're, they lived in a city and in a time where that was normal, so sure. And actually, it's a primarily suburban phenomenon now that I think about it, because both in rural areas and in highly urban areas, True. it doesn't really make sense. And in fact, if you see old movies where there were young children, you know, standing on the corner shouting, extra, extra, that's the kind of thing that happened in cities where there would just be, you just go to the corner and somebody would be newsies. selling a newspaper. Yeah. Watch there Newsies you if you're wondering what he's talking about. Yeah. So somebody like me who grew up in a suburb where it was very common to be like things were close enough where it's like you could drive there but not close enough that you would walk there really that's where the whole paper delivery phenomena was very common and by the way there was a popular video game an arcade game that was that came to the nintendo called uh, paper boy that was about delivering newspapers and the arcade cabinet actually had a bicycle handle that you used to control it Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Another thing I'm not familiar with is most arcade games because, <laughs> again, rural areas. Okay. Sorry. So, so, again, you may be wondering, well, why in the world did you create a language for these girls who are delivering newspapers in suburban America during a time when that would have been a perfectly normal thing to do? Mm -hmm. That's because they also featured time travelers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so these time travelers were our speakers. And in the comic books, um, you can see this is a, a screenshot from one of the pages. And so you can see the four girls um, on the left. If you're looking at, well, if you're watching the video, um, what you see is a screenshot where the four girls are on um, one side of the pane and they're speaking in English because they're just, you know, in America. And then on the right side, you see these people who are like highly cloaked. So you can really only see their eyes and um, their speech bubbles are filled um, with characters that are definitely not English. And it, so like when you look at it, you're like, OK, they're speaking another language. Yeah, the, the characters, by the way, in design, they're very similar to Chinese characters, but a bit too... Um... Straight line. Yeah, like too straight line and too kind of formulaic. So they're clearly not Chinese, but um, but also like like if you look at the top one, well, I'm looking ahead at the next slide. So maybe I'll let you go to that first, and then I'll talk about what we see in the top one. Well, no, I'll just I'll just say it. If you're looking at the slide, if you look at the top line, you see that there are two characters that are identical right next to each other. Um, and that's the type, and two characters that are reversed that are right next to each other. This is the type of thing that is not usual um, in something like Chinese. In fact, if you go to the lower right panel, you'll also see two identical characters next to each other. Um, and that is just something that, it, it's just, it just doesn't, you wouldn't expect that type of thing in Chinese, where most of the characters are standing for full words. Um, you wouldn't expect two identical characters to occur right next to each other in like such a short amount of dialogue. Anyway. No. And in fact, that's because in the comic books, what they were speaking was actually a cipher. And it was an intentional use of a cipher. This was not, oh, we don't have the energy to do something. It was um, the fact that, well, the author, you know, Brian Vaughn, and then also the illustrator, um, did it for him, wanted readers to be able to break it and read the dialogue. So they wanted it to be something that they could like, if they stared at it long enough, they could treat it as a puzzle and they could figure out what these, you know, time travelers were saying. And so they really wanted it to be breakable. Therefore, it's really just like a letter for letter glyph for letter, I guess I should say, cipher of English. And that was a purposeful thing. Hmm. And so that is the comic book setup. That leads us to Amazon's Paper Girls, where Amazon, I guess it was Amazon Prime, essentially, yep. picked up um, Paper Girls as an option for one of their TV shows, so for one of their series uh, that they had recorded. And so they contacted us to create a language. 
And that is why we created the Quechua language. Now, the Quechua language in terms of like the actual name, uh, the name we came up with. They just wanted a language for these, you know, time travelers. Yeah, the futuristic ones that were speaking in glyphs in the comic book. Yes. And so in terms of the language, the speakers were these time traveling you know, speakers. So they're time travelers. And we wanted to maintain, and, and they also wanted us to maintain the spirit of the original cipher and novels without actually creating a cipher for English. And so, um, but they wanted that spirit to be there where if people researched enough and did enough, they could potentially try to break it. Um, and so it's like they wanted that, that overall feel to be there. And so that leads us to our vision. And our vision was to create a worldwide Creole of sorts, because these are time travelers who could pop up any place, anytime. Um, and so we wanted them to take words, essentially, like borrow words into their language um, from wherever they were, whenever they were, uh, and use them as sort of um, code words in their language. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And so we created a unique phonological and grammatical um, system as the base of the conlang. So like there is a, a base that we were working with, like these are the sounds. So if they borrow a word from another language, it needs to be filtered through uh, the language's sounds. So that way when they borrow it, it's not a perfect you know, reproduction of that word. It's however they would pronounce it, just like how we borrow words into English um, or any other language, you know, speakers borrow words right now. It's It gets filtered through your phonological system, but then it also gets filtered through your grammatical system uh, to actually be used in sentences and whatnot. And that part, by the way, was a priori that uh, we just uh, created that. Yeah, 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 that was that was our own doing. Um, and then we had borrowings from any language at any time in history. And that was really key because that led to some of the fun that we had. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's not just, say, borrowing from, you know, like there are some borrowings from modern English, but we could also borrow from old English. We could borrow from, you know, Middle Egyptian. <laughs> we could borrow from, you know, what, whatever point we wanted. And then we filtered those borrowings, of course, through the, the Conlang's phonological system to make it sound like it belonged to the language. But then we also semantically coded the borrowings. Um, and so we're going to talk more about what that means, but it's like we didn't want to just straight up borrow, like if they needed a word for train, we didn't just want to borrow a word that meant train. We instead thought about like what might a train remind them of and like what word could they borrow from another language um, to kind of match that spirit instead of just doing a straight semantic borrowing. So um, I think that's where we had mm -hmm. the most fun. Yeah. So, but first let's talk about the sounds. And so the Quechua sounds, there's a very simple phonological inventory, uh, one that we chose because we thought it could reflect sort of a generic, if, if there's not a better word, sort of like a, yeah, you're going to sound like a lot of different languages as you speak this. And also like we wanted a base set of sounds that as we borrowed from a variety of languages, we could at least approximate a lot of those sounds um and so yeah like i it was more of like hey we want sort of a, a really standard base to work with yeah it's a delicate balancing act if your phonology was too large which i think might that have been some, uh, conlanger's um, instinct for a project like this i mean you end up with with all these borrowings it's just you know pronouncing like every single word perfectly in its native language and so what it just sounds like is it sounds like you're saying words in a bunch of different languages rather than you're speaking a single language mm -hmm. so it's like we wanted it to be large enough that it could accommodate the uh, general phonological spirit of a lot of words from many different languages but different enough so that almost every single borrowing would be altered in some fashion 
Yeah. And so we ended up with um, a stops series of, you know, P, B, T, D, K, G, and then the glottal stop, which mm-hmm. pretty, pretty standard yep. across the board. Um, for the fricatives, we did F, V, S, Z, and S, J. But then we added in the interdental th and the, partially because we knew in advance we would be doing a lot of borrowings from languages that had those sounds, and we didn't want to turn them all into Fs or Ts, um, but also partially because we wanted, and they had wanted, like something that would clue speakers in to the fact that this is close to English, but not English mm. at all. Um, and so we wanted to, to keep those sounds to be sort of reminiscent um, values, I guess, if you will. Yeah, and uh, and we weren't going to have the uh, the velar, uh, not the velar, we weren't going to have the glottal fricative, which mm. meant that a lot of words were going to be transformed mm-hmm. and be a little bit unrecognizable. Yeah. So we wanted yeah. to keep something else in there. And then uh, for approximants, we have the W, the L, and we did um, the R instead of an approximate R. We did the flap R. Yes, more and then, versatile. Right, right. And then the Y from the palatal series. Um, and of course, with that flap R, that meant that we could take any trills and turn them into flaps. You know, so it was yeah. like it was just sort of exactly like you said, more versatile. And then we had the M and the N, and then. You know, one of the variants was like it would show up as an angma. The nasal would show up as an angma before a velar consonant. But like it's not a phoneme that you would see like at the beginning of a syllable or something like that. Yeah. And so those are our consonants. Our vowels, uh, we sort of started with the classic five vowel system, the e, u, e, o, a. But then we also added the schwa in again because so many times we were going to have these unstressed vowels that we wanted to be able to keep the the unstressed feel of them um, as we borrowed from things like English and other languages that do that. Uh, but then we also had like an A, E, and O, O alternation between stressed and unstressed syllables. Yeah. And so, um, again, sort of like making it feel more like some of the languages we'd be borrowing from. Because we knew in advance we'd be borrowing from a lot of Indo-European languages. And so we wanted to mimic the sound systems without copying them. <laughs> yeah. And this vowel system also, it's like it forces you to push um, the uh, lax vowels. It forces you, forces you to tense them. And also to uh, mix up vowels with those mid vowels because of the, um, the quality distinction mm-hmm. is tied to stress. And so... You know, actually, it's not tied to stress. It's tied it's to open and closed because it's oh, keshwa, not keshwa. Right. That's right, keshwa. And then when it's open, it's a. A. Okay, yeah, so it's good. open and closed. That's right. Sorry, I misrepresented that. Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. Uh-huh. Ooh, uh-huh. Fire me now, David. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then uh, that, that schwa, it, it's, it was going to pull it back from sounding too much like something like Spanish um, mm-hmm. where there's no unstressed you know, vowels like that. This is going to keep that in there so it would sound a little bit more familiar all right so in terms of so those are the actual sounds we were working with um, in terms of stress um, our basic stress system was the penultimate syllable um, however borrowed words could end up taking different stress depending on what was borrowed and like where they would have determined like the highest emphasis would have been placed Mm -hmm. when they borrowed the word um and so it was really like if you were a non-native speaker and you heard this where would you think you would need to put the most stress and we tried to follow that yeah um but if all else was equal uh then the the basic stress was penultimate um and we'll talk about this later uh in the in the podcast here but when we created grammatical words to sort of fill in the the gaps it was always penultimate stress um because it was like that's their native stress system um but we did have again some some words that fell outside of this basic penultimate stress including examples like shoya which means to follow, and it's shoya, 
with ah, not shoya, because it's stressed. Because it's stressed, yeah. If it were stressed in the opposite way, it would have been shoya. Mm -hmm. But it's shoya, because that means to follow. We'll talk about where that came from later, by the way. Um, another example is genjin, which means to track where like the stress is on that second syllable, genjin. Um, and so, yeah, borrowed words could differ. When we borrowed words and they differed in the orthography, we put accent marks where they differed. In if the romanization. They, right, in the romanization. Thank you, we not orthography. We didn't get to create we did, the orthography. We did not do an orthography for this language. Thank you for correcting me. Even though we pitched it to them and said, please let us do this. And like, eh. Right, right. In the romanization, however, mm -hmm. we put accent marks to indicate this unexpected stress pattern. All right. Um, and so a couple things about Quechua stress um, is that we made it so that it stays on the root even when suffixes are added. Mm. Um, and so that means um, that's always fun. That it was sometimes pulled in different directions. But we also made a rule that it could not fall beyond the antepenultimate syllable. So it's like, yeah, it's going to stay on the root. But if we add too many suffixes or if the stress is in a place where you add, you know, a multisyllabic suffix, it's going to move with it. And so as an example, we have the verb kewi, which means to help. And then if you turn it into a noun, you have kewika, where you stress that first syllable because the root is kewi. And you're only adding one syllable, and so you can keep it on that antepenultimate k we got. Of course, when you write it in the romanization, you then put an accent mark, an acute mark, over the um, initial a of k we got to indicate like, hey, it's not k we got, mm -hmm. <laughs> which would be the normal way of doing it. Yeah. Um, and so we have a lot of examples like that. However, a verb like aquat, which is a little bit different. When we add the suffix to make it into a noun, we get a quadega. So it's aquat, initial syllable stress. To know. Um, to know, sorry, thank you. And then to get knowledge, we get we can't have aquadega because that's too many syllables. Mm -hmm. So we have to get a quadega. So we have to move the stress over one. That's fun. I it like is that. fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good one. Aquatica. <laughs> mm. So good. So good. All right. In terms of actual syllable structures, because I know you're all wondering, uh, we allowed CCVC syllable structures, um, but in those consonant clusters that are in the onsets, you could only have an approximate following another consonant. So like that's the only allowable consonant cluster is a consonant plus an approximate. No others were allowed. And that allowed us to like borrow a lot of words and sort of hide them <laughs> in the borrowings, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So when we borrowed words, the first question we asked ourselves was how would non-native speakers hear this word? Because I mean, honestly, that's the most important, right? Yeah. Because uh, when you borrow words, you're not thinking about how do they write it? You're not thinking about any of those things. You're thinking about how would you hear it and repeat it? And that's how it would end up getting used by other speakers. And so what was more important to us than anything else was listening to, um, you know, the phonology of it, saying it out loud. How would you hear this if you were a non-native speaker? And then this, the follow-up question to that was how does that perceived unit shift to fit the Quechua phonology? And so that was the second very important component to borrowed words. We're going to go through some examples, but we can't really go through examples without also talking about semantics. Yeah. Because, again, there were no straight borrowings. And so it's like I don't want to give away examples until we talk about the semantic aspect of it. And so let's look at an example. So in English, we have this phrase. It's all good. And so if you were to write that out, it's all good as one unit, mm -hmm. you would get a transcription that matches that. And so all fine and dandy. But like if you say it fast, 
you don't necessarily say, it's all good. You oftentimes will only say, it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's all good. And so notice the T and the L have pretty much disappeared. It's all good. But like, do you even need that initial I? <laughs> do you? <laughs> you could in fact just say, it's all good. And in fact, that's the basis of the joke for Saul Goodman. Uh, if you've never seen Breaking Bad or Saul Goodman, the follow-up show. No, I didn't know that. Huh. It comes from It's All Good Man. Huh. And so it's his con name. That's not his real name. Oh, I didn't know that. And so he came up, he has his con name as Saul Goodman. Hmm. Saul Goodman. Okay. Oh, wow. So there you go. You don't need the initial it. You could just say Saul Good. But of course, if you're saying it even faster, you may not even hear that uh, that final D. So good. So good. And so that's what we went with when we borrowed this expression into Quechua. We're like, we're going we're gonna to deal with so good. Mm -hmm. um, but in Quechua, unstressed vowels are typically schwa's. And so if it's not stressed, it's going to get schwaized in most cases. And so so good becomes saga and saga is what we borrowed as a phonological unit into Quechua. can you um repeat for me that word that you said that happens to that last vowel it gets what schwa eyesed it's a word because i just said it and you knew what i meant and so now it's a word and you didn't you had a glottal stop that time before you said schwa -ized. Ooh, well, that's even prettier. It's more like schweizd. <laughs> you know what? It's a word. All right. So we borrowed saga mm -hmm. into Quechua. And we retained the original spirit because we decided that was going to be like a response to like something. If somebody is talking to you and you just want to be like, okay, or it's okay, or it's fine, it's all right. Um, sort of just like that generic, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they would say saga, 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 <laughs> saga, saga. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and so we actually sort of maintain the semantic gist without necessarily, while, I should say, expanding its borders. Yeah, that's like, a good way of expressing yes. it. Yes. Mm. Um, and so that's how we borrowed it's all good into Quechua, saga. Another one, I really like the next example, by the way. Hmm. Um, and so in Quechua, we have datip. And datip is from English duct tape. And that's because um, duct tape, when you normally say it, comes out as duct tape or duct tape, where you can barely hear that K. Hmm. And so we decided they just, you know, wouldn't really borrow that K in because it's like when you say duct tape fast, you don't really hear the K very much. And so mm -hmm. they heard duct tape and just called it the tape. And so um, one phonological change that we made was that any schwa like sound in a stressed syllable becomes an ah in Quechua. And so duct tape we decided that initial syllable was stress because that's where the stress really is when you say duct tape um became da tip and so uh we did change that so that that changed a little bit another phonological change is that we have tape in english but in a closed syllable all a sounds become e eh in quechua and so da tip is the the final phonological result yeah that tip that's it. And Duh. so it, it doesn't, ex it sounds like if you squint at it, it sounds like could be what you're saying. Like you could be saying duct tape, but it's distinct. Very exactly. Cool. Yeah. And, but that's not even like the coolest part. Mm -hmm. The coolest part is the semantics. Mm -hmm. Because in Quechua, duct tape means to repair, to fix, to patch up, to heal, to ameliorate. Mm -hmm. And why does it mean that? Because duct tape can fix anything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, by the way, I don't know if you grew up with this phrase. I grew up with this phrase. Because <laughs> literally duct tape fixed everything 
in the country. I don't know if it does the same in the suburbs, but in the country, it fixes everything. Like to the point where one year, I won't talk about what what caused the fender damage because it was really sad, but my dad had some fender damage to his truck. And so the front was like, you know, like rattling and moving as we drove. And so he pulled over on the side of the highway and got some duct tape out and duct taped it together and we kept going. (laughs) And so literally it fixes everything. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So because of that phrase, um, this was actually, I think (laughs) must have been one of my suggestions because I don't think you would have thought of duct tape fixing everything. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that I think is a great example of how we sort of semantically shifted some of our borrowings. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good one. That makes me smile. Um, All right, so another example is Duma. And this actually came from Swahili. So Mm -hmm. we're going to move away from English examples here and talk about some other languages we borrowed from. Just just an example of other languages because we actually borrowed from a lot. Yeah. Um, We borrowed from this word from uh, Swahili Duma, meaning cheetah. And the first shift we, of course, made was that unstressed ah. Becoming a schwa, because again, those unstressed ah sounds are schwaized, schwaized, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so duma becomes duma. It's schwaized. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we have this casual duma. And that came out to mean to hurry, to hustle. And this one was David's idea. I remember having this conversation. Well, yeah, I just thought, you know, she just moved darn fast. And it's like, well, if you could borrow from anything, you know, borrow it from Swahili. And it's also, um, and by the way, the reason, well, of course, cheetah ends up being kind of short in English, but it was like, you want to go to a place where cheetahs, uh, a language where cheetahs are, because then the, the word mm-hmm. is likely to be shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, Duma was great. It's like fit right in. Not only likely to be shorter, but like, I feel like as time travelers, they would be more likely to pull from the more appropriate languages. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's like, they're going to be there anyway. May as well pull from the language where words come from. (laughs) (laughs) Or where they apparently, they can borrow uh, curry from Danish. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So in case you're wondering, okay. (laughs) Like, I don't even know where to start in the story other than the fact that when we were in Denmark, we asked the people who were there with us to take us to um, a place that served traditional Danish food. Mm -hmm. And so they did. Mm -hmm. And one of the things on the menu was curry. And we were both like, what? (laughs) How is this traditional Danish food? And yet everybody there said, oh, yeah, if we go to grandma's house, like grandma probably made some curry. And we're like, yeah, what? So it's not even like current traditional Danish food. It's like, oh, yeah, one of those comfort foods that your grandmother makes, always making curry, apparently like decades ago. It's so bizarre. It's not anywhere, anywhere as spicy to any curry that any of you are thinking of if you've never had Danish curry. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like they may not even use pepper in it. I'm not... <laughs> 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 it's like, how can we remove all the spice from any curry ever and like decide that that's our, our national dish now? Yeah. Um, it was so bizarre to both of us. So anyway, we we ordered literally everything on the menu yeah. because we wanted to taste it all. And so we tasted the curry, but I was like, this is not really curry. And they're like, yeah, no, it's Danish curry. <laughs> It was kind of like, um, and I understand why it, it has this idea of hominess, because it, you know, reminded me of like, you know, chicken noodle soup, like the chicken noodle soup of curry. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, because it was more of like a, just a gravy yeah. with extra spices, but not spices in terms of like herbs, I should say. And, uh, but in case you're wondering, yes, absolutely 100%, the curry flavor was there. Yes. It just wasn't spicy and it was very homey, strange. Yeah. So who knew? Yeah. There's Danish curry. <laughs> uh, well, for anyone who's listening to this who is from Denmark or has visited Denmark, they're like, yeah, yeah, Danish <laughs> curry. Um, but speaking of the Scandinavian world, mm-hmm. 
the next example comes from Finnish. Mm -hmm. And this example, uh, tika, is the word that was borrowed, uh, came from Finnish tika. Tika. Oh, thank you. You do that so much better. And by the way, just a, a little note here. You'll notice uh, Finnish, since we're studying Finnish, you know, it has vowel harmony. But the I and the E are truly neutral. So even though they're front vowels, you would expect tika, but you don't get it. You get tika. Oh, nice. Huh. And you get that geminate K in mm -hmm. case you can't really hear that coming through. It's oh, the, yeah. the KK. Um, and this means dart in Finnish, like a, a thing you throw mm -hmm. um, at a dartboard. Um, and so Kajua borrowed it, and in Kajua we decided we would reduce all geminate consonants. And so we yeah. don't get tika, we just get tika. And furthermore, because that a ah is in an unstressed syllable, we don't get a, ah, we get a. Ah. And so tika. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we borrowed. And in Kajua that means to try, because we had decided that, you know, when you try something new, it's kind of like throwing a dart at a dartboard. You <laughs> hope it lands. <laughs> you see what happens when you throw. Uh, and so we, yeah, we decided to borrow that. I don't know why we chose finish of all things. I think, honestly, this one was an example where we came up with the semantic concept. Yep. Looked it up on, um, we, well, we used Wictionary a whole lot. Yeah, just um, to, see, to like, get ideas. Yeah, to see which languages had short words for it, you know. Yeah. And then also just which ones had phonologically interesting words as well. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes what we saw was like a lot of them were super similar to what we have in English. And so there were definitely times where we avoided a lot of Germanic languages and other languages that had words that were really similar to English because we didn't want it to sound like everything was borrowed yeah. <laughs> from English. Mm -hmm. um, and so we also looked for some, some variety in what we were getting. All right, so these examples have all been single word examples. However, we also did compounds and we didn't restrict our compounds to one language. Mm -hmm. And I think that made it super exciting. And so if you recall earlier in this podcast, I talked about genjin, that's actually a compound. And so um, the first half of that comes from Mandarin gen, meaning to follow. Or sorry, I guess that would be gen, because that's high tone. Uh, and then the second half is from Czech Stin, meaning shadow. And so it's to follow a shadow, essentially. But we borrowed from two completely different languages. Kezhua, by the way, is SVO word order. So no matter what language they were borrowing from, the verb in a compound would come before the object, like in to follow a shadow. Hmm. Um, and so Kezhua, we get Genjin, where you can see that we did a difference that Czech Stin we not only like dropped the T because if you recall, there's no consonant clusters um, that allow stops in that second consonant position. And then we also voiced the sh of um, check to j uh, because of that N that is at the end of that first syllable um, from the Mandarin borrowing. And so we get genjin. And that, um, whoop. Oh, we only allow consonant clusters with approximants, right? I forgot I put that as a whole slide. So yep. if you're listening along, I am just showing on the screen what I already said, um, as well as the N causing the voicing. And in Kajua, Genjin means to track. Because if you're tracking, you're kind of following a shadow. Yeah. <laughs> and so that one was a really fun one. And so we had a lot of fun coming up with these because, again, like examples like this where borrowing for multiple languages for compounds, which meant we were able to really semantically play um, with a lot of concepts and play with a lot of sounds of like what would sound good together in this particular case. Yeah. Oh, oh this language, <laughs> we did good. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the grammar aspects. I've already mentioned that Kajua was SVO. And so that meant, you know, as a lot of head initial languages, we have prepositions. Um, we decided to put the adjectives in front of the nouns they modify. Um, and then we did nouns followed by relative clauses. And so these are just, you know, some of the features that will come up. David had an amazing idea for Quechua nouns. 
<laughs> and so you were inspired by Hawaiian for this. Do you want to kind of walk us through the singular and plural definite and definite distinctions and why you were inspired or how Hawaiian inspired you rather for us to come up with this system? Uh, well, it looks like um, the split is exactly like Hawaiian's in that uh, for Hawaiian, there is a difference between, there's an indefinite singular marker, he, and then there is a definite singular marker, either ka or ke, depending on the, well, kind of depending on the consonant of the next, of the word. Uh, but then there's only one plural marker for both, and that is na. Um, and uh, they're all separate words. Um, they're not actually affixes. But um, it's just kind of a nice way to organize things, I think. So there's no like indefinite plural. You just always use na uh, to mark plurals everywhere. Um, and so then we did this, and I don't like 100% remember where everything came from. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I feel like my preview doesn't give enough. I wonder if I can slide over without changing the slides. Oh. Uh, you can, but you just gotta. Okay. No, I don't have these examples. Okay. Doggone it. Um, I wish I remember. <laughs> um, in the verbs, I give the examples of where they came from. I mm -hmm. guess in the nouns, I didn't give them the love. Yeah. But, but that's okay. Um, we have these examples where like kid, if you say like the kid singular, it's just tamago. Tamago, um, yep. And so that's nothing is marked, nothing has changed. Like that's the root. Um, and then indefinite, we get idamago, where you actually voice that initial T. Um, and that's because I believe this comes from one and that the root for one is in. Oh, okay. I think. Huh. Well, then why didn't, why didn't the end show up? Because we decided, because it shows up as like, it's not a, it's not a full prefix. It's a clitic. And so it like, no, it can't come from that because, yeah, because then later it shows up. I'm going to have to look it up. I am so sorry that I don't have, we should have your laptop right here so we could look it up. I'll put it up, I'll put it up on the phone. Um, see if you can find the source of the indefinite because in the, um, if it's a consonant initial like tamago, you voice it if it's voiceless. So idamago, but it's like written as, um, you know, like I hyphen. So it's like a clitic. It's not a full prefix. The plural marker is an, and it shows up as its own word. However, it affects the beginning of any voiceless consonant where it becomes voiced. So it's not on tamago, it's on damago, uh, because it's kind of treated, it's treated almost like a clitic, except it's its own word in front of it. We don't actually, look under um, the these I. Are, these are the old words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So look under I um, to see if we have anything, because I tried. Uh, he, she, it. I, that from its days as an expletive object where the object is an entire clause that who used form relative clauses so i think so it, it's, it's just coming e. from that um oh be, but our intervocalic i think got got voiced yeah i think that's what it was um and, and so it just comes from the the root e yes and um and I think that it's uh, so that it, it was basically it was um, it was a pronoun. So that was what was giving it its definiteness. So it's okay. like, yeah. So that's that one. And okay. Then, and then the plural would be un, um, because that's the same. Did we not mark that one? No, we didn't do that one. That's unfortunate. How, you know, this is so unlike us. We we write everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a glottal stop section? Because it could also be un. Let's take a look. We should have a glottal stop section. Yes. Well, we have the not. That doesn't help. Mm. Well, if we look enough into it somewhere, I'm sure we have the source of these. Um, I don't know. Maybe also you were just like, we need a source and we're going to make it sound good and... That's going to be that. 
because some of these are just casual roots that are so old that yeah. they just are what they are. Yeah, so it's so, just a plural marker. Yeah, it's easy enough to just grab that. But it was the form AN, so it was going to cause uh, voicing for, um, for consonant initial ones, which is cool. Yeah. Um, for vowel initial, then you just get, you know, like plural of um, our word for walkie-talkie is ala. Um, and so plural is just anala. Um, it's just, again, on as its own unit in front of ala, no change. But the, if you recall, the indefinite singular of kid, idamago, um, when that e clitic is in front of a vowel, it turns into ya. So instead of yala, we get yala. Mm -hmm. And so a walkie-talkie is yala, plural, anala. If the root happened to start with the vowel e written as the lowercase i in IPA, we changed it to j, which if, if you follow along with languages David has created, that is one of his favorite sound changes. And so target, mm -hmm. for example, is iga in the definite singular. So the target is iga. A target is jiga. And targets, whether it's definite or indefinite, is aniga. Yeah, and... Um... Uh, Allah, I believe, comes from holler, right? We don't have it written here. Oh, what? oh no, wait, no. No, uh, Allah does not come. It's no, actually it's from Arabic and Andy from... Um, yeah. And Andi Lasli comes from... Andi comes from Handy, which comes from yes. German. Uh, yes. Handi. And then the and second then half is Arabic. Arabic is El Asli. Yes. El Asli, which is original. And so because talk is like it's an original cell phone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, yes. That's hilarious. Now, but the word for chill for for child is just incredible. Just incredible. Comes from uh, Vietnamese curious tomo. And then uh, the Korean uh, go, which is nose. And uh, the expression here is that children have curious little noses. Indeed. I think that you wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> and don't they, though? I, I suppose they do. And that's and what kid so, is. Yes. Let me tell you, we had so much fun creating words in this language. And it's funny, too, because it looks like the word for egg in Japanese, tamago, uh, which is a different, like, intonational pattern. Um, uh, I don't know where ega comes from. Do you? Um, I don't, you can look that up. But one thing I do want to point out is that with these compounds, you may notice that in quite a few of them, we have final stress. Hmm. Um, and that is because, um, the modifiers come first. So the head word would be last. Yeah. And so, uh, for example, tamago means curious nose. Mm -hmm. And so nose is the head word. Therefore it's got final stress. So like you will it's see like though. Yeah. genjin, final stress, tamago final stress and yes it's marked in the orthography yeah. no not in the orthography in the romanization mm -hmm. oh my gosh david you just need to push me off the chair when i say the wrong word mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. right ego comes from eagle like the eagle has landed yep mm -hmm. all right so one other thing we did with nouns because we didn't actually do a lot with nouns mm -hmm. we wanted it to be a relatively simple um, grammar in terms of putting structures together um, one other thing we did was we did proximal versus distal demonstratives, um, as suffixes. And so, for example, our word for foot is yamba. And then, um, our word for walkie talkie is ala, which we've already seen. And, um, if we have, um, a consonant final stem, I don't know why. Oh, because it's yambwas is the original, sorry, foot is yambwas. Yeah, Let me right. say with that an, correctly. With an S. With an S. Um, we add agi as a suffix, um, for like this and then aya for that. Um, and then the S voices. Yeah. And the S voices. So like this foot is yambwas agi and that foot is yambwas aya where you get the stress on that final syllable of this thing that was added. Um, if it is a vowel final, you just get gi and ya being added. So ala gi, this walkie-talkie, ala ya, that walkie-talkie. And for those who are wondering, you indeed have it correct. These came from Spanish. <laughs> Yamazagi. <laughs> I love it. Yamazagi. Um, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. 
Um, all right, so let's talk verbs. These I remembered to mark. Why I didn't do the nouns, I don't know. It's all good. Is it? Saga. Saga. Saga, <laughs> saga. Um, all right, so here is a verb chart for the verb to know. Aqua. Now, in case you're wondering, because I don't think I have this in here, aqua comes from iCloud. Ah, that yeah. is literally the borrowing because it's like if it's knowledge, it's in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. And so um, iCloud came into their language as aqua. And so that means to know. Um, we're going to kind of focus on some some things, but the first thing is like aqua is like sort of the, the plain form. Uh, and so it's just like to know, and that's in the positive. If you want to make it negated, you add a glottal stop. So it's very similar. <laughs> so it, it's aqua to know, aqua, not know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so similar. But we wanted to play with some of those ambiguities that happen in, in natural languages. Um, all right. So let's talk first about a distinction that we did that is kind of unique. This language, again, is for time travelers. And so we had a present and non-present tense form for the verbs. And so that's not like normally what you see is like past tense, non-past. If you have like a two-way distinction, maybe future, non-future, some languages have that. You don't really in any natural language that I know of, you can help me fill in blanks here if I'm wrong, David, you don't see a present tense versus non-present. So it could be past or future in this non-present tense. Yeah, I mean, there is a, you will have like uh, present versus non-present with the understanding that non-present is the past. Um, or you might have like, oh gosh, no, I, uh, I can't think of it. But it's like, it's because of the way, of course, we experience time. You know, like it makes sense that you would mark what's going on right this second as special. Uh, and then if it's not marked as special, you assume that it's already happened and you need something different to mark the future. But where, with this verb system, it's like, yeah, what's happening at this very moment is special because things can be happening before or afterwards. And, and essentially to a time traveler, they all basically already have happened unless they've been affected by, you know, their actions as time travelers. And so they experience time differently from the way that we do. And so that meant that we marked, um, we marked it special for like, I know in this current moment versus I knew or I will know because again, like in a time traveler's timeline, my tomorrow could be there yesterday. Yeah. And like you don't know. And so it's like it's essentially a way of saying it's either true in this moment that I'm talking to you or it was true or will be true. Yeah. And really there's not there's not a huge difference because, you know, to a time traveler, there's just the time I'm at right now or a time that I could get to via time travel. And that could mm -hmm. be in the in the future or the past. Doesn't right. really matter. Right. And so for the um present versus non-present, um, those forms, we have a prefix for both of them. The present tense, the the um, root that it came from is ima, meaning now, which is yeah. just a casual root, like nothing, it wasn't borrowed. Mm -hmm. And so imakwat means I know, like right now. And then la meant then, again, just like a, a basic casual root, it wasn't borrowed. And so lakwat meant I either I knew or I will know. Um, and then the negated forms are those same forms, but with um, that glottal stop. So um, the M drops out though. So imakwat, I know. Iakwat, I don't know. Lakwat, I knew or I will know. And then laakwat, I don't, I didn't know <laughs> or I won't know. I refuse. <laughs> I refuse to know. By the way, that uh, little personal note, ima is the same word that you use for like now in Kamakawi. Oh, is that why you suggested it? Yes, it is. Oh, that is so nice. Mm, good connection. <laughs> um, all right. So in verbs where the um, root begins with a consonant that is voiceless, like kewi, um, to help, 
you end up voicing it. So you get that present tense form, igewi, and then lagewi for the non-present. And so it's just like you do voice in, intervocalically um, those roots when you add prefixes like that. Um, kewi, by the way, uh, we had mentioned that before, meaning help, and that comes from the English carry. Yes, it does. And so for those that play video games, that's where it comes from. By the way, I'm, I'm looking at these imperatives. We didn't remark on them last time. I'm guessing that things are attached with a hyphen so that we didn't have to put any stress marks, right? Because it's kewi na, yeah? Kewi na. Oh, with the, we aren't there yet. Don't, don't worry about that part of the chart yet. Don't jump ahead. <laughs> Let's talk about those negated forms, which I had yeah. mentioned were glottal stops. They come from a root ha, meaning not, but casual lost its H, yeah. and all the H's became glottal stops. And so that's why the negative forms all have a glottal stop in them, because it's essentially just a means not. And so in most cases, um, in a lot of cases, you're only going to see a glottal stop um, being inserted as the negated form. So that's where those come from. Cool. Now, um, and those glottal stops, by the way, show up in front of the, the vowel initial. If it's a consonant initial like kwi, then the, the a vowel does show up. And so kwi is to help. A gewi means to not help where you get the a uh, vowel, but then you also get the voicing of the K because it's now in between a uh, and a. Okay, we, wow, that's and cool. And so, isn't it? Yeah. Um, all right, so those are some forms. So let's look at a few other examples. Um, casual verbs, more examples. We have inena, means to breathe, inena. I should get my stress right which comes from English, in and out. In and out. Oh in my and out. God, in and out. Breath is in and out. And so oh here's the thing though. If we were gonna do present tense negation, mm -hmm. don't breathe, we would get in and out. And we decided we didn't really like that. Mm -hmm. And in so in we decided to do some dissimilation for verbs that begin with the e sounding vowel um, in the present tense they would actually become a as a present tense marker so instead of that e present tense marker from ima we would get a when there was that negation where you kind of had to add it so don't breathe is actually a inena and so we were much happier. That was our, our sigh of relief. Yeah. Ah, that's much better. <laughs> I was inspired a little bit by Spanish where the word for and in Spanish is E, but if it comes before another E, it lowers to E. The, the word for or in Spanish is O, and if it comes before another word that begins with an O, it raises to U. Nice. It's a bizarre little quirk of Spanish that if you speak any other Romance language, you get to that and I'm like, woo. <laughs> but there it is, because yeah. it sounds better. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's talk about these imperative forms that you've already remarked on. So sorry. Mm -hmm. So the imperative forms, as David noted, we have these suffixes joined with hyphens. And that's because they are sort of end clitics. So they're clitics, but they are, uh, they're a suffixes. And they're actually the pronouns for you singular and you plural. Um, and so, for instance, aquat if you recall, means to know. And if you want to say like, I'm going to snap and point my fingers and be like, you, singular, know this. And I'm just, you know, like pointing my finger like, no. Yeah, don't don't bite it. I'm, <laughs> I'm pointing it because I'm very serious in my command. Um, then you're going to add this clitic na. But because aquat already ends in a consonant, we don't actually put the N in there. Instead, we just voice the consonant that came before it. So aquat becomes aquada. No. Although I shouldn't stress on the final syllable because it's still aquada. There we go. Um, actually, I don't think, I think it's still stressed on aquada. I think that's how we did it. Yeah. Gosh, I don't remember. I for think sure. that no, I think that's why the hyphen is there. That's what I was to saying. To remind. So that um, otherwise we would need to put 
uh, an acute accent mark on right there. Right, on there to, to remind us that the root still carries. Because yeah. this is just a clitic. It's yeah. not. So it's aquada. Aquada. And so aquada. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to make that plural, su is the you plural pronoun. And so notice it begins with that voiceless S. And so it doesn't voice the T at the beginning of aquat because originally it would have been aquat su. And so it's just aquatu. And yep. so in this case, this is an example where you have a consonant that doesn't voice intervocalically, but it's because of that historical reason. And then you can, of course, be like, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do not know this. Um, and you just add that glottal stop like we had already seen as a prefix. Um, in this case, because it begins with a vowel. And then if you have a verb form like kewi uh, that ends in a vowel, then you add the, the N from na, you singular. So kewi na means like, hey, you help, singular. Um, and then you plural is su, but then in this case, that S is actually showing up. And so it voices to a Z. So kewi zu is, hey, y'all, help. Yeah. Now. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, the, the negation shows up as the prefix, as we had already seen. Okay, so now that we've walked through that, let's look at a couple Quechua sentences. All right. We are running long already. Yes. And so we're going to fly through these. All right. Are you ready to fly? I'm ready to fly. Get some wings. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Quechua sentences. Um, so the first example I pull out, pulled out was era idagan. Ooh, I said that totally era wrong. Thank you. I put my G and N in the wrong places. Era ida, idanagi. Mm-hmm. I really want to say idagani. <laughs> Era idanagi. Era idanagi. Mm-hmm. They are coming. Mm-hmm. So here, era is our pronoun from Quechua in, you know, an old source, meaning they. And then uh, to come is actually um, from Swahili tanga, meaning wander to wonder as well as it's a compound with spanish a key mm-hmm. so it's tanga a key uh means to wander here that means to come isn't that kind of delightful mm-hmm. and then that present tense marker e uh, which voices that initial t and so we end up with idanagi uh, with stress on the final syllable because of that spanish a key and so we get stressed there all right, so that's one example. Another example. Go ahead and read this one, David. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Ozula mamagami si memesis. Oh, that's right. Okay. Ozula mamagami si memesis. Perfect. That means we have located the folding to 2019. We'll talk about the folding in a moment. Mm-hmm. In, in a moment. <laughs> My word. In a moment. My word. All right. First of all, ozu is just a Quechua pronoun, meaning we. La maba. Uh, that la is the non-present tense suffix, or prefix, rather, that, again, could mean past or future, but it's just like it's not in this current moment. Maba means to locate, and that was borrowed from Spanish, mapa. Which, of course, is borrowed from Greek. But, yeah, my goodness. How fun is that? Um, gummy is the word that they have for folding. Oh, this is good. Which was borrowed from Japanese origami. Yeah. And so in the, in this time traveler universe, um, where you can travel from one time to another is called a folding. Cause essentially it's like this idea that these times have sort of like in the timeline folded up on each other and you can jump from one to the next, but it only happens at key moments. So it's, you can't time travel it just anytime you want. You have to know when the, the times are going to like hit on each other. And so those are called foldings. And so we decided to borrow that word from Japanese origami. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, C is a preposition meaning to, just from the Quechua language. And then we get to mimesis. Oh, no. And that means 2019. And this was really fun. And this was an idea I had that David went with. And thank goodness he went with it because I was just like, we got to do this. I was so excited to present this to you. I decided that for dates, not all numbers, just dates. This is an important distinction here. Mm-hmm that we should convert the the dates to Roman numerals first and then convert Roman numerals to sounds. 
I know. I know. But I'm like, these are time travelers who do things. Just, just go with it. And so quite a few of the Roman numerals have really obvious sound counterparts. So like um, an I in Roman numerals could be in, you know, lowercase i, E in IPA. A V could be a V in L, U, D, D, M, M. What's, Fine. What's that sound that the L makes? Oh. 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 You're going to do that, not la? But that adds a vowel. I'm just, oh. <laughs> not making it a whole syllable. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That left the X and the C, specifically for our language, because we needed to make it fit, again, the phonology, but we also needed to make sure it didn't overlap any of the other sounds that were already taken for the, the Roman numerals. And so we decided that X's in Roman numerals would be s, yeah. just an S. Basically the KS getting simplified. Right. And then the C would be a k sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now that we've got that, that means you got to first write the date you want in Roman numerals, second, convert them all into IPA according to this conversion system. <laughs> Woo! All right. We had a few rules on top of that because it can get quite cumbersome. So we decided that an epithetic A would break clusters. It couldn't be an E because that means something. Yeah. And so we needed it to be something else. We decided that an epithetic glottal stop would break any E, E segments because we didn't have long vowels. And so if it were like V, I, I in Roman numerals, we wouldn't have a way of differentiating six from seven, V from V, because we don't have long vowels. So six would be V, seven would be V, E. And eight would be? And eight, we had three E, E, E segments. We decided to convert that to E, E, which then got converted to David's favorite, EG. So six is V, seven is VE, eight is VG. There You're we awesome. go. <laughs> and then we also decided that the S, which was the X, right, hmm. would voice if it came before a V. And so it would sometimes be a Z sound because that didn't, you know, mess with anything else. Okay, so back to 2019. In Roman numerals, 2019 is M-M-X-I-X. -X. So that leaves us with M and then S-I-S, -S, so m -S -S. But we have the M. I'm totally missing yeah, a missing syllable. A, a syllable. Oh, my gosh. But just, on the next slide, the next I slide. have it. Yeah. We had M-M-S-I-S -S yeah. was the original. We needed to break up the, the M's and then the S after it with the A epithetic so we have me me cease and so that's how we get 2019 Mimesis. we had some more complicated Mimesis. dates than memesis in fact one of our dates we had to do is 1988 which in roman numerals is m c m l x x x v i i i it's a lot so converting that into the ipa counterparts we had M K M M K M L S S V I I I. So we had to insert a lot of epithetic A sounds. So we have Mek Mel Sis Sis V, and then we had to of course change the the long yeah. triple long I to V G. Mm -hmm. And so to say 1988 in Quechua, you would say Mek Mel Sis Sis V G. McMill uh, says, says VG. Exactly, David. McMill says, says VG. Yeah, so, uh, so the thing is, like, I don't think you're going to show this line, but we had a line, a very long line, where it was right, something yeah. like, we're here in 2019. We came from, you know, 1988. We need to get to the folding in 2019 because we're stuck in, 20, in 1988. And, like, they kept saying them over and over again. And so there was so many of like, you know, you know, McMessies, McMenless, Seth Vegetables. And it's like, like, oh my God, it was so difficult. I think 1999 was thrown in there too. 1999, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Oh. Um, but, but I think it was really a fun way of being like, you know what? They're, they're time travelers. They got, they got time to work this out. And it's kind of a fun nod to like, 
the whole like years as dates being written in Roman numerals and it was such a wacky idea and I loved it and it also fit very well with the kind of like this thing was said in the 80s and uh, for uh, again younger people when you watch older movies um, I think it was in the 90s when it finally changed but if you watched an older movie and watched the credits and it listed the date at the end it was always and only and exclusively written in no Roman numerals mm -hmm. up until like the early 90s, I think. Yeah. And I mean, even then, like we still use Roman numerals to keep track of a lot of things like Super Bowls. Oh, sure. We've got but a I... Super Bowl number with a Roman numeral. It's not a year, granted, but the fact that we still keep up with this idea that we can use Roman numerals to like count things. Oh, yeah. It's still prominent and it we... makes it special. Like it's like. If you see the Roman numeral, it's it's like part one, but one is the Roman numeral. It's because it's something special. Yeah, but these are for very small numbers. Like even the Super Bowls, right? We're getting up to like 50 something right now. But it was like when you saw it on movies, yeah. like it yeah, was like, like, this you know, 1988 one is just great. Yeah. And you'd see it like all the time. If you stayed till the end of movies, it'd be like, oh, there's the year. I can't read it, but there it is. <laughs> well, it's obvi obviously. Nick Melsell says a busy busy. <laughs> oh, I totally said that wrong. But that's obviously what it is. McMelsell says Vigi. McMelsell says McMelsell says Vigi. McMelsell mm -hmm. says Vigi. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. We got it. All right. So all that is to say, maybe we hope you have noticed that we had so much fun creating Quechua. Um, it honestly like. As, as we were talking about examples from vocabulary, and this was actually for like a completely different thing, like we were coming up with an ex examples for a presentation. Mm -hmm. And so we were both going through um, the dictionary and having all these memories and like, it was just so neat. And it was one, of, it's one of the languages where I have said more than once, if we have time, you know, we're not working on anything else. I would want to return to that language and like fill it out with mm. more vocabulary, even though Paper Girls wasn't renewed. Therefore, we're not going forward with the language um, unless somebody picks it up. Somebody with a lot of money, pick it up. Um, <laughs> season two. Hello. Um, like we're really we have no plans to actually use the language beyond this, but I would love to expand it because like. It was just so much fun coming up with those cool semantic borrowings and things that we could do with the language. Yeah, I've worked on, um, you know, a few projects that either didn't go anywhere or like were up for like, you know, a single season or maybe like one movie, but clearly we're not going to get picked up ever again. But of all of those projects, this language is my favorite of yeah. those and the one that I really wished could have you know, seeing the light of day. And I really, I, you know, if it's so weird because it's like it's such a short time frame. But if this thing aired in uh, the summer of 2019, I guarantee you would have gotten a second season. Like mm -hmm. things have changed in streaming just over the past three years yeah. to where they're, they're less willing to take a chance um, than they were beforehand. Um, and so, man... Uh, of course, there were also some behind the scenes stuff that happened that uh, played, I think, a bigger role in it. Things that had nothing to do with us um, in that, you know, when we were brought on, you know, we had a Zoom session with the creator of Paper Girls, as well as the showrunner and one of the other writers. And it was a very, um, you know, positive meeting, a great conversation. And it was like the next thing that we heard was suddenly that showrunner wasn't working on the show anymore. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and honestly, I'm kind of like at that stage, I'm kind of surprised that it even finished. But basically, I think that when they filmed the whole thing, it wasn't the same crew that started it. It was. And yeah. so I, I especially think in terms of our usage in the show, if they even knew that they were there, the, the new people didn't care. No. <laughs> and no. didn't see the purpose of us being there. So it was like. Who knows if it even got in a second season with that same crew, maybe That's we wouldn't true. even have been back. Yeah. Um, but regardless, yep. we had fun. Yes, we did. We still love the language. And we want to say a big kope, which means thank you. Kope. 
And now I can't remember where. Does that come from Copico? It probably <laughs> comes from Copico. No, I have no idea. <laughs> you still have it open, right? Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah. okay, Cope. Um, oh, Thai. Oh, nice. Yeah, very, um, and it's not how it sounds in Thai, but it's like, you know, filtered through our language. Uh, I think maybe we chose it because it sounded a little bit like Kobe. I think so. I think so. <laughs> uh, because why wouldn't we want to be reminded of Kopiko every time we say thank you? Mm -hmm. Kope. Kope. That was a good one. So before we go, okay. or actually here, I mean, saga, as, saga. As, as we say, you know, thank you and sign off. I think that we should at very least say the one thing that I assumed you were going to include in here. Oh, no. What? Keshwa. Oh, Keshwa. Um, the language name itself actually comes from the English word casual. That's right. And <laughs> we wanted it to essentially be like, you know, this is casual talk. Yep. Just casual. <laughs> Keshwa. Like it. Yeah, I probably should have included that. Yeah, well. That's all right. We got it in there. You remembered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, we hope you enjoyed learning about Kejwa, the language of ours that could have been but never was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or it never will be. We don't know because, you know, non-present tense. Mm -hmm. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, lobby. Just lobby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we hope you enjoyed hearing about it. And um, until next month, stay grammar. Bye, everybody. <laughs>